a man is somebody who is a provider, loving, caring. That is a man. A protector, that's a man. <laughs> to be a man is to be a leader, a father figure. Men are born tough and uh, strong, you see? You have to be courageous. Well, I'm actually not courageous. I'm afraid of a mouse. <laughs> Since I've got kids, to see them growing in front of me and make sure that I'm providing for them, like that thing makes me happy like nobody's business in the world. Honestly speaking, I don't like what I'm about to say. The best thing about being a man is not having to deal with other men. Because I look at men today and I'm like, if I was a woman and I had to deal with one of this, I'm not sure if I'd be able to live. The Creator had perhaps intended us to be on this earth so that we can be the protectors and the guardians both over nature and over our female species. You know, men, traditionally, we believe in the dominance of the male in the family. So there are just so many benefits of being a man. Hey, I don't have to wear weave. I don't have to wear makeup. I don't have to wear nails. You know, it's easy to maintain a man. I'm Zulu, so patriarchy is something that's in me, unfortunately. And I have to admit that there are certain parts of it that I do like. I do like the fact that a woman has to look at me and treat me like I'm her king. It's amazing, it makes me feel great. The things that need to be changed, the language that we're using when we see a gay person, a lesbian person, or someone that is out of our comfort zone. This is the language that our young boys, he knows from home, so when he grows up, he grows up with this anger and kill. I find it so difficult because like, as men, we like to bottle things. Even if we can't do anything, we are scared to say, I can't do this thing. A man is expected to always be strong, you know, uh, not show so much uh, emotions. Uh, it's challenging because a man is, uh, in black communities, not supposed to be depressed. It's not supposed to, to be stressed, you know? So now, once women start now having the economic power, then they start to challenge that kind of authority. And then it, to men, it, that is inculcating some kind of sense of inferiority because now it feels that your power is being taken away. And then to men, that is a challenge. Now, in order to be seen as, as a man who still has an authority, he would vent that in unacceptable ways. Men are divided into three groups. They are good men, a great men, and they are bad men. But me, I'm a good man. I'm a good man. I don't kill, I don't think, no. Without women, really, this wouldn't be a planet. There must be women in life. Everyone must treat them very peacefully. I think me as a man, like I violated my own beliefs. I also violated like the, like the female gender. Using this as an advantage, like I'm a man, like you have to like take what I say. So yeah, man, I've come to realize that that is wrong, that is abuse. Man. I should be in prison for this. So the first step would be in us having to address that, but do I want to address it? I don't. As long as it does not feel like an injustice to her, then it's okay. I like it. It's my privilege. I don't want to challenge it. And that's sad. That's really sad. So annually, the Ujama Center that is based within the University of KwaZulu-Natal hosts the annual memorial Yudi Similani lecture. It is a lecture that aims to hold in a fine balance the complexity of queer lives in the South African context, 
thinking about uh, homophobic hate crimes and violence committed against queer people, but also reflecting on queer agency and meaning making. This year is the fifth instalment of the Yudis Milani lecture, and our theme for this year is Men, Masculinities and Homophobic Hate Crime. I think the most important reason why we host this lecture every year is to stimulate complicated conversations in the South African landscape. Because the situation of gender-based violence and homophobic hate crime is not being resolved. It's not getting better, it's actually just getting worse. Uh, so this year the production of the lecture uh, consisted of two parts. So firstly we interviewed men from Kwatema because this is indeed the landscape in which Yudi lived but also ultimately died. And then we invited Professor Zetu Matabeni from the University of Forte to be this year's keynote speaker as um, she represents a close proximity to the life of Yudi and her queer scholarship in the African landscape is a unique voice that is imperative for a time like this. It's, it's a very broad topic, you know. Um, men, masculinity and violence. And I think because of we are in South Africa, we start at looking at the colonial encounter, uh, which was very patriarchal, masculinist. And that automatically shaped our notion of violence. Um, and you know, we did a number of things, and I was thinking about this recently, actually. Um, so, colonialists did many things, and one of them was what people call raping of the land. So, taking it without the locals' consent, <laughs> indigenous people's consent, um, and feminizing it, feminizing land. Um, and in that feminization of our land, um, everybody, because they were colonized, became feminized. Indigenous men became feminized. Um, and women were just actually nothing um, because they had already been feminized. So their rape, their rape was already predetermined because the main resource, like the most valuable resource, could have been was taken without consent. So, you know, if, if you can if you can rape land, if you can take land that's not yours, it means you can take anything, right? And so that. Um, that thinking of having the power to take something that's not yours has been transferred into our society as a norm. Our society is so comfortable in taking. <laughs> um, because we, 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 now we don't even know that actually it's wrong. And if you can take the most valuable resource, the one resource that you don't think is valuable is already taken. So the women in this space are actually for the taking. So through this political engagement, you've already said, we will rape the women. <laughs> because the land is already something that we can gather up without any kind of, um, I mean, I don't even want to say compensation, but without any kind of consequence. Um, and it's a, and it's, a, it's a painful thing to actually engage with as a, as, as a black South African, because, you know, we, we've been wanting alternatives, wanting different ways of understanding how we can reclaim who we are, how we can reclaim our space. But of course, we cannot use 
the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. <laughs> That's Audrey Lord. So, um, I, I, yeah. If you want to think about men, masculinity and violence, we go back to that history and go back to the internalization of how we become who we are um, as, as people, who and what frames our way of seeing the world. And so if we, if, if we automatically assume and we take for granted that things are for our taking, then we should question our own sense of humanness and humanity. Because in essence, there's nothing really differentiating us from the colonialists. We are our own colonizers. So, and you can hear here, I'm not just talking about men, because I do implicate all humans, whether they are um, bodied as female or male, we've all been part of this. Recently, we had lootings in the country. Everyone was implicated in that. And it's part of this that, we, you know, at some point, at some point we can feel that anything is for our taking <laughs> without consequence. Um, we can take a body, we can take a child's body and manipulate it and violate it without consequence. We can take a woman's body and violate it without consequence. We can take our most valued resource, violate it without consequence. What would it take for men to let go of their privilege? Um, because, I mean, many men know this is a lie. <laughs> yeah, but they have to repeat it because it's part of their survival. Um, and, and I mean, I think our work is to always um, uncover the lie. Um, and we do it and it's exhausting because we're working against um, a lie that is couched, whether we call it religion, whether we call it culture, whether we call it tradition or all kinds of things, or even in gender relations or yeah, <laughs> in colonialism, you know, but it is a lie um, um, and men know it. Even rehearsing the things that they're the head of the household, they're supposed to provide and most men don't provide. They don't, that's the reality of South Africa. Most women will tell you. They, I mean, houses are female headed. Um, men have disappeared. <laughs> they don't pay maintenance. We know that. <laughs> so what are they providing and to whom are they providing? They're not. So they're not providers. They must stop that nonsense. They're not, they're just lying. Um, I mean, yeah, we can, we have this evidence and they do know that they're not, they're not providing. They run away. I mean, you know, there's, uh, uh, there are lots of these kinds of like uh, reality shows. So there's one called Babgeld, where men, they, as soon as they see the cameras for this, uh, in this car that's branded, they run off because they know they're being held accountable to go and pay maintenance money. And they don't. Even the ones who have, you know, really like well-paying jobs, they don't. We've lived in these families where our fathers have not been accountable. Our mothers were running the show and they were covering up for these useless men. Um, mine included. <laughs> um, but, you know, they'll be the first ones to say, oh, my daughter is this, my daughter is a doctor. My son is a this, but where were you the whole time? So for me, I'm not, I, I don't buy this uh, nonsense of men being providers. Maybe there are some men who do it, but on a whole, when we talk about men as a class, pff, please, <laughs> I want to see some real provisions. Like if you are a provider, God, like this, this country would be a really different place. And if you were a carer, None of us would be crying about being raped and murdered in our sleep, in our bedrooms. Um, yeah, 
And if you were a provider, children would not be getting pregnant right now at, at the age 11 to 13. So I don't buy your argument. So the queer figure, for some strange reason, we've created it to be something odd, which actually it isn't. So the first time the word queer appears in South Africa, um, and this is when I'm doing archival research. So the first time we see the word queer within the lesbian gay space is um, at a pride march in Cape Town, the first pride march in Cape Town. Um, that pride march was organized by the organization that was called Abigail, the Association for Bisexuals and uh, Lesbians and Gays in Cape Town. And they were obviously involved in, in a lot of um, what was actually the beginnings of the Treatment Action Campaign. It wasn't called that at the time, but they were part of this organizing. And, and, and the first Pride March was, uh, the theme for that Pride March was towards a queer South Africa. And I, I saw this and I loved it so much. And I was like, here are these working class people, black, and they're imagining something so big for this country. This constitution had not existed at that time, but they had imagined a queer South Africa, a space that would be inclusive of everybody, regardless of their class position, their gender identity, their sexual orientation, whatever, you know, and, and they were doing this um, on that street, passing that street of parliament, trying to tell these lawmakers that, hey, we could take South Africa to a, a really wonderful place, a queer country. <sighs> Fast forward <laughs> to 2000 and whatever. That pride becomes something else. I don't want to talk about the politics of pride, but queerness becomes an oddity. And you wonder why, when it was actually a space of imagining, a space of seeing a future for a country that was right at the beginning of, you know, like it said, this country was newly born and you could see this child becoming like the most brilliant thing you can ever imagine, this genius. And for some strange reason, that, that space of imagination just collapsed. Um, and I don't understand how we, and we, I'm also implicated, we kind of rehearsed and rehashed this idea that, you know, being queer is not part of being African because people, politi politicians in, you know, in African states were saying this um, and we couldn't use that moment of imagination to offer something different, to say actually queer is what you should be aspiring to aspiring towards like you want to be queer you want you want a continent that is queer uh, we, we, we weren't able to do that and and I feel sad uh, personally because I'm like well these guys did that Needy and Teresa they they gave us this thing Zaki they gave us this this idea and and we kind of lost the ball because we got so excited about enjoying the 
L and the G and the B and the T and the I. By the time the queer came, we were like, we're all something else. So for me, that, that notion of queer was not really about identity necessarily. It was about the bigger picture. What is it that we are becoming? And, and it's, a, it's like a global framework, so to speak. So that's why I'm attracted to queer, particularly because of its beginnings. And I want to, to, you know, to bring it back and say, hey, you know, here it is. Like, these people said it, said it already in the early 90s. And we didn't really understand what they were doing. And let's, let's, let, let, let's take it forward. So now queer is, now queer is this thing that is an African, not part of religion, because it's so associated mostly to lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, um, which are only actually like legislated identities. Um, and, and marrying, marrying this imagination and with these small identities, for me is, is where we kind of lost the ball. Um, and how we have participated in us being othered. Why is it important to remember? <laughs> It's a funny question in a way, because uh, I mean, I think for me as an African, my life is about remembering. I don't exist outside the space of memory. I mean, when we started having this conversation, we started with memory, because your email sent me back to a memory of being in the court and being torn apart by the memory of a young woman who had a full life ahead of her. Um, and imagining myself being that person. <laughs> there are so many moments that uh, so many moments that um, <laughs> that transport you to um, to an imagination of how you would be. So. Um, there's one moment you can think about you this life and think about the moment of death. Um, we'll talk about a little bit about the moment of death. Um, and that moment for me is so telling. So in this moment, um, and PT says, here's the guy who one of the guys who murdered Yudi. PT says, she looks at me and she says, hey, you know me, I know you. And he claims that at that moment of recognition, he panics. murders, he kills her. There's another moment, and I mean this, you can unpack this in so many different ways. A moment of recognition, having a conversation with someone you know, and by looking into your eyes and acknowledging 
familiarity and he decides to kill you. You haven't done anything. Another moment um, a young woman lives in Cape Town. She's walking home. She lives with her grandmother and her niece. She gets home, it's about six, maybe six forty-seven. Sun is setting in Cape Town. She walks home and she goes into the bedroom where her grandmother is lying on the bed with the granddaughter, the niece. And casually, it's like she's coming home to be with Gogo and that's where they stay. They all sleep in the same bed. She had closed the door, naturally. Walks in, closes the door, goes into the bedroom. As she's in the bedroom, we are now in a bedroom, so you can imagine this. As she's in the bedroom, there's Gogo sleeping there. And there's the niece, this grandchild. He's in the bedroom, a man pushes the front door, gets into the bedroom, and shoots at her. And she says, in shock, how? <laughs> Meaning, what have I done to you? That was her last word. You follow me into my home and you shoot me in front of my grandmother. Her name is Mpume Zangolonzi and she was shot multiple times in her bedroom with her gogo and her blood had splashed all over the walls in front of the niece and her grandmother. All these women speak. They speak before they die. And they ask important questions. I remember these questions. And it is these memories that haunt me. <laughs> Because up to today, that man has never been found, and that man could never answer that question. What have I done to you? Because they didn't do anything. She didn't do anything. You didn't do anything. So we remember because we want to understand how it is. Well, for me personally, I want to understand. I guess it's a personal endeavor. I need to understand how it is that my death will come. <laughs> I have to be honest, I'm a black queer person in South Africa. <laughs> Seen um, as a nothing because I'm a woman. Um, but I also understand how other black women, and particularly black queer people, continue to be seen. And how it is that we can change how they are seen now, so that they can have a different story about their experience of death. I find death in South Africa very traumatic. Very traumatic. Um, we all know that death is a part of life, it's all going to happen, but for, for women in particular, guys, it's unforgivable. What men do to our bodies is, is really unforgivable. Yeah. So I hold on to, I hold on to these memories to understand more. Hopefully one day we can say, well, 
If we understand what it is that you do, we can help you stop it before you do it. I'm not there yet. <laughs> um, I'm not there yet. But what I, what I do understand is that because of, um, I mean, I've said I've, I spent a lot of time thinking about death, particularly about death of queer people and black women. Um, this idea of, I'm not even calling it dehumanization, to be honest, this idea of nothing, doing violence to that which is nothing. Um, and, 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 and I think many black women, many women and queers are put into this category that um, um, that men can they can over I use the well it's not my concept but I use this notion of overkill it's Eric Stanley's concept they can like overkill because there's, there's it's already a nothing so so for example let's take the case of uh, Nostelum Debin who was uh, murdered here in East London she's a Fortes student the guy kills her and then chops her up yeah <laughs> and puts and, and puts her body parts in a plastic bag and a suitcase what is that what is that <sighs> we followed cases where these are gruesome man <laughs> gruesome queer people were so violated to the point of to, to the point of Nostello in actual fact. So by the time Nostello arrives, this idea that she's been so brutalized, for me it was not a shock because I had seen it so many times um, um, happening to, to queer people that Yeah, like, I mean, I think a point is being made that this body is really a nothing. Someone can put a hose pipe through your mouth and they force it down that they want it to appear elsewhere in the body and put and like open the tap up or they can shove a toilet brush all the way up your organs like this is this is these are the things that are happening so for me it's like there's 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 a thing that we need to understand as queer people that if we don't do something we will continue being this non-entity this nothing and the noise that we may have to make is not a noise that and this is my critique around queerness at the moment it's not a noise that is that is that, that waits for violence to happen. We like to make noise when there's a a gay person or trans person who's murdered. The noise we have to make is a noise where we are recreating ourselves as something else. Because we we exist in the popular imag imagination, we exist in the realm of nothing. We have to undo that. I think for me, the project is how do we make ourselves better humans? Because all these things, I mean, these ideas around gender, we've brought them to ourselves, right? We've created gender constructs, we've created femininity, masculinity, we've created men, we've created women, we've created these things. So we've created toxicity. We've also created very beautiful things like deep connections and love and intimacy and joy. We also created violence. Uh, we've created all these things. Um, and they're part of 
they're part of the experience of being human. Um, but for me, the challenge is, as humans, how can we maybe recreate masculinity to be something that is, that is much more beautiful, that is not always associated with toxicity. The, the, the dominant version of masculinity is what hurts men. But I think men need to be invited to actually understand how vibrant masculinity can be. It doesn't have to be something that constrains them. Um, as I'm saying, you know, I've seen versions of female masculinity that have really revolutionized the world. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, if, 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 men, if men can detach from this dominant idea of masculinity as one thing, that it, it suppresses who you are, it, 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 it puts so much pressure, it demands that you don't become vulnerable, it demands that you don't expose yourself, or it demands that you, I don't know, like break your back because you can't break down. I mean, that's bullshit. I mean, we've known. So for example, there is, we can, we don't talk about this version of femininity as masculine. So in South Africa, we know we have this, this notion of women as in Bogot. Hmm? Women are rocks. I mean, how masculine can you get? <laughs> how more masculine can you get? You know, um, but we also know that because of that masculinity of women as rocks, women are vulnerable. Women bleed, women cry. And, and this is a beautiful version of masculinity that we like that men can also recognize. So, like, we don't say men are in Bogoto. <laughs> no, they're not. It is us who are in Bogoto. The most firm and hardcore things that actually, they, I mean, men break us apart because of that. So it's, yeah, maybe then that is, that is toxic masculinity. Again, going back to this notion of taking, taking away something that you feel belongs to you, but actually it's not yours. So you're taking it away from women because you understand how valuable it is. Men have a lot of work to do. And I don't feel sorry for them. They have real work to do. And they have not even scratched the surface.